Hey everybody, welcome to Friday. Hope you've had a great week. And alrighty, I'm going to be ripping through a bunch of, um, quite a variety of low friction uh, news topics. First, I will get through those as fast as is possible for me. You'll notice that both my shirt pocket buttons are done up, so we're going to be off to a smooth start already. And that's a great portent for things to come, I am sure. And then I'm going to, yeah, a bit overdue to take you through what Mr. Low Friction's bike fleet is. Good time overall to do it because yeah, I did turn 50 last week and as part of that, very excitedly uh, have a wonderful new addition to the bike fleet. But overall, uh, it'll be interesting to see what you think of the yeah, bike choices and also the gear choices on those bikes that I have made and whether or not uh, you believe they are good or clever decisions or a little bit left of field or potentially stronger language than that. Right, first one, just looking again at uh, where we're at with SRAM and their chainware recommendations, which have been a bit of fun. We're getting closer to a chat, so I uh, had a contact from SRAM again this week saying, let's uh, dial in a phone call, and I said, absolutely, and I'm just waiting on that one. However, they must be discussing it and making you know, some movement at the back end there because there has been a change to their website. Uh, so just a quick recap, this is what the website said with regards to chain replacement not too long ago. You can see there in regards to when should the chain on my SRAM red axis group set be replaced. It said flat top chains last longer than 10 slash 11 speed road chains and should be replaced when they measure 0.8% or 0.8% it says on an approved chain checker. Replacing a flat top chain too early may prematurely wear the chain ring and cassette. And so there were two parts we're chasing up with regards to that. One is why is their recommendation 0.8% as opposed to the generally accepted 0.5% being the limit that you really should go to? And obviously then the final sentence about replacing chains early causing premature wear to the cassette and chain rings was pretty bonkers. And uh, that was one, I guess, the sentence that we really wanted to discuss. Uh, the website now says, Flat top chains last longer than 10 slash 11 speed road chains and should be replaced when they measure 0.8% on an approved chain checker. See the full list of approved chain checkers or order one from our SRAM Nation store. So it's great that the, yeah, frankly bonkers second sentence has been replaced by something that um, is rather normal. However, yeah, the 0.8% uh, recommendation is still in my view and others very problematic or concerning with regards to what that may do to your component wear. And it also is concerned just leading into the next little update, which is uh, Josh at Silka recently did a great video on basically what is really the difference say between chain stretch and chain wear. So really looking to stop calling it chain stretch because that's a bit misleading and that really it is chain wear, but it goes into um, a great bit of depth in regards to exactly what's going on inside the chain exactly how the chains wear and cause that um, you know, elongation, which is often then referred to as stretch. But yeah, some of the, I guess, the deeper level things that are actually happening are quite fascinating. So um, I will put a link to that video uh, in the description and yeah, I'd really recommend taking the time to watch that. So Josh runs through some, I guess, a really interesting aspects with regards to this whole recommended chain replacement mark in that you know from their own i guess studies and investigations into you know what happens with chain wear that there is a point where the friction mechanisms inside the chain will ramp up quite a lot and so how the chain is behaving and how the parts are moving under load that will change as those parts become more worn and that this, I guess, 0.5% mark, um, it's not just there as a mark to you know, help prevent you causing accelerated wear to your cassette teeth and chainring teeth. Things can really deteriorate um, much more rapidly from, I guess, a friction perspective and a performance perspective, taking it uh, much past that point as well. In essence, taking chains to you know 0.8% and, uh, and beyond it's just bad news on pretty much all fronts. You're really going to eat into your uh, cassette teeth and your chain ring teeth, which is not low friction running and it's also costly. And you're going to just see ever degrading performance from the chain at a more accelerated rate. So, you know, 
All of that is basically adding up to, I really, really want to have that uh, chat with SRAM, find out why they have a 0.8% recommendation and what are their answers to the concerns that we have both from a component wear perspective and also a chain uh, friction and wear perspective as well. As soon as I can get that call, I will obviously be excitedly updating on the next video. Uh, just for the avid racers out there, uh, in case I forget on the, um, the, the following vid, um, to ensure you have a lovely, super fast uh, chain for your, you know, for your race days, obviously it makes a lot of sense to have a dedicated race chain and training chain as opposed to rocking up to race on the same chain you are smashing through your training blocks. It's not something you'll tend to see at higher level racing. And considering it doesn't really cost you any more, you're just pre-buying one chain. You are always going to need a new chain, uh, you know, sooner or later. So just uh, having pre-bought one to be your dedicated race chain. And when that wears to basically around about sort of, I, I move mine on by 0.2%. And that becomes my next training chain. And by that time, depends on obviously your racing versus training volumes, but somewhere around there, my training chain is also going to be about ready to you know move on, or I've just got that waiting in the wings for when it is, it is time to move on my training chain. So, and then I'm just buying one new chain as per normal to break in and be my next dedicated race chain. So yeah, apart from pre-buying your first one, it, it costs you no more, and it's just a really smart way to roll. And by not taking your dedicated race chains too long, um, you're obviously always going to be racing on a beautifully efficient chain for your system. Alrighty, you may remember uh, a nice heads up on what's inbound uh, from last week. Um, fuckwits who don't understand tolerances. Um, zero fiction cycling. Now this wanker is going to get reamed shortly, but we'll we'll save it for him. I've been lining him up lining him up and in but um yeah still waiting unfortunately for my big uh, expose um hopefully in coming soon but yeah overall it's gonna be great because we're gonna be able to just finally talk about some stuff without it being me that started uh, or kicked off a whole bunch of drama with uh, someone who loves drama and who loves to ream and you know bully people now it's gonna be a little bit tough for some to step back from a completely emotional thinking place because they're a massive fan of uh, of Hambini to a place where they can evaluate information presented to them obviously from both sides and use the actual thinking part of the brain to evaluate the information presented to you on its merits and see if you arrive at a place that you know place where you landed because your brain was able to process that information uh, that obviously can be difficult, and it's one of the biggest problems in this day and age. All right, to continue, yeah, the, the hors d'oeuvres as we lead into the upcoming ZFC versus Hambini series. I'm going to link you to a video um, with another guy who had just the, the most awesome run-in um, with the, the world's reaming or, or self-appointed global reamer in cycling. Yeah, it's pretty unreal. It's... Uh, I mean, it is so obvious from so early on who is incorrect over something extremely basic. And what's unreal is that, you know, like, it's honestly like, despite being an engineer, he doesn't even know that this basic tool exists and is used, like, all the time with bearings. Uh, so the argument over this is... I can't believe that it actually took place and that it took place over, it actually took place over a number of videos. The one I'll link you to is, I guess, really just the one to be able to sort of skip to to see the, I guess, the, the, the wrap up and the, uh, the conclusions. It's pretty unreal. But he does advise uh, in that as well that, you know, he had people telling him, you know, hardcore fans of, uh, of Mr. H that, you know, he was wrong, even though they, and they admitted that they haven't even watched his video. So we're going to come up against a bit of that where if somebody is a hardcore cult fan and they're lodged very firmly up somebody's clacker, they ain't coming out, they are not in a position that, you know, the, the actual thinking part of their brain has left the station some time ago. They are incapable of taking information being presented to them from one side to, you know, to present the, uh, obviously, you know, what's going on from their view and the other side and actually weighing up information on its merits and forming an opinion. 
there's none of that. It is just, you know, and because you guys shouldn't be doing it for me either. You should look at the information that I present to you and look at the uh, the counter and make an informed opinion. And if you think I'm incorrect, let me know that you think I'm incorrect and why. Uh, there's just, why is that so hard these days um, as opposed to just literally one-eyed thinking, be it in just about any topic you can imagine. I, I don't get it. it. It's just so antithesis to me. Um, and it's just, I think, one of the biggest problems in the world. So all I can ask to any who uh, see this, and I'll do a quick reminder of that uh, before I do the actual sort of first official video on where things all went wrong a long time ago between uh, me and the global reaming person, um, that we just get our thinking brains on, that's it. And then have a look at the information from both sides and arrive at a place that's your place uh, based on that. You know, let, let's just not be so firmly lodged up, you know, anyone's butt that all our rational thinking is, is just, you know, not happening anymore. Yeah, so thank you to a Reginald Scott who uh, yeah, put together that great video, which I will link in uh, uh, this or uh, well, my video description today. And I did watch a couple of others uh, of Reginald's just for fun. And um, yeah, it, it's kind of relevant in that as I go through my bike fleet today, Reginald's watching this. I actually have a lot of very different thoughts to Reginald on quite a few areas of, uh, I guess, what makes the best bike or what makes a great bike. So we certainly don't think alike on a lot of things. And I could probably make a quite a long video um, discussing ins and outs of sort of Reginald's points of view versus my points of view on, you know, what makes great bikes. But one thing I do know is that if I was to have a, uh, a discussion with Reginald about my thoughts on, uh, on certain things in cycling versus his, I would get a respectful, intelligent discussion. And as you'll see when I do get to my uh, video, uh, Reed Hambini, that is certainly uh, not often what happens if you ask somebody a valid question. Um, you can get quite a different response from that person. Yeah, it's going to be a, a whole journey. So it's going to be grand old time. Last quick bit on the Hambini hors d'oeuvres this week. Uh, I know, yeah, I think some were upset that I linked to a website which um, raises a whole bunch of very interesting questions about Mr. Hambini. And that uh, sort of viewed that as, you know, doxing, so to speak. So apologies, I didn't cover when I initially put that link on uh, last week's vid that there was nothing new you were going to see there that he hasn't already shown himself because he's made his own video going through that website. So he scrolls through, scrolls through the whole thing um, on his sort of, I guess, counter to that. Uh, so there's nothing new that you would see by uh, clicking on that link that I initially had there that he hasn't already shown on his own screen on his own video uh, so hopefully that helps alleviate some concerns for those who may have initially been a bit upset so just be doubly safe and in case um, yeah, anyone sees that video that hasn't seen this video I removed the link um, anyway and just replace that with look hey there is a website out there um, that raises some interesting questions if you want to go and google it um, but yeah I would be difficult to dox someone that has already shown all of that anyway. Uh, with regards to his answers that he covers on that video uh, to that website, that's going to be a whole other aside that I may or may not bother with um, at some stage because it's it's really outside of where things all went wrong uh, between myself and uh, the Global Reaming Authority a long time ago. Uh, which is really just more on the bearing side. So I'm going to focus on that um, first. And then, um, yeah, possibly we'll go into some of the questions and responses there because uh, some, I guess the most important question uh, that was raised by that website was very much brushed over. Um, but more on that another time. All right, there we go. Whole bunch of news, under 15 minutes, which for me is not terrible. Thank you for yeah watching the news updates. Let's go check out the uh, ZFC fleet. Uh, I am going to start with the oldest and work my way through to the newest. I do have a few bikes, so I am going to set a timer, I think, and try to limit myself to five minutes each, unless I really have to go over it. But let's see. Here we go. Just a quick um, heads up. I'm having to use my little guy's uh, DJI Pocket Pro 
So the sound is going to be different. The portable mic for that is not working. So I've got the camera mic, which is going to be different sound to this mic, which I will try to adjust in edit as best as I can uh, with the very limited skill set I have for such things. And yeah, I'm probably going to be fighting the gimbal uh, on this thing a bit because I always fight with this damn gimbal on that camera a bit. It would be so much easier if I could use my phone. However, uh, and again, likely because I'm retarded and or because it is uh, an issue between sort of, I guess, just Android PC. I've come up against this a bit when I sort of film some sort of test machine stuff for clients. I will video it. It's too big to send uh, just via Wi-Fi or via email off the phone. So I need to copy it across to the PC and send it via Dropbox. I could probably do that via the phone if I ever get Dropbox sorted on that. But I don't understand why when I plug my phone into my PC, there is no way for me to um, sort all the files because I've got thousands of them of you know, photos and vids by create a date, date modified, file name, doesn't matter. I cannot get them in any type of chronological order uh, or any order that makes any sense whatsoever such that I can just go to the uh, video I have just taken. Uh, and use it, I have to spend quite some time going through the thousands of uh, files to find the video that I've just taken and needed. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just not faffing with that today. I am instead choosing to fight with the DJI uh, Pocket Pro. And fingers crossed, it goes okay. Alrighty, starting all the way back in 2010 with a Melbourne Star Oppie for $2,000. My first, uh, yeah, bike back into uh, getting, oh, yeah, from running to cycling. It was overall a great bike until it wasn't the rear uh, right-hand side chainstay cracked. And it's now had a great second life as a, uh, as a test machine. We can see the red Avanti there in the background. That was my wife's first bike, which is also now a uh, test machine. And these two are in the midst of being reset. I should finish that over the weekend. We have two more tests uh, to get started. One of them is a fancy new wax from somebody. And whilst I'm just in this area, my the bike that replaced, sorry, I am struggling with this gimbal. I can't use my phone for video for a probably very novice reason. However, all right, stop fighting me camera. Uh, the bike that replaced the Oppie was a Cipollini RB1000. Uh, that was also a great bike up until the time it hit a kangaroo on the rose white uh, descent in bright and so yeah there's it won't show up in this video but there are a bunch of cracks in the fork and also down the frame uh, so that was the end of that one however insurance did enable me to replace this with a new Cipollini RB1000 and that was my road bike for a long time until well, one I upgraded with a, a second uh, bike, which we'll see soon, but also I mm, just got a little bit, it wasn't my favorite that uh, Chippo was uh, beating up his wife and sister, and I just didn't really want to be seen on a Chippo. So that is now my trainer bike, so dedicated trainer. It is handy to have one of those, so we're just walking across to the gym. It often actually resides, uh, so did a heat spin session yesterday. We have a nice sauna in the gym and I can actually fit um, the bike basically in the gym. I just drape a large felt car cover over the back, which goes over the, oops, sorry, over the back of the chair there. Usually able to maintain uh, the, sorry for the video playing up, uh, temperature in the sauna of around about um, sort of 50 to 55 degrees. Uh, depending on how hard I'm working, though, I might dial that down to 45. So, yeah, basically, fun having a dedicated trainer bike because you don't have to faff getting it on and off. Um, this one's had a pretty good life. It's done about 45,000 kilometers now. And a couple of things to chat about. Uh, I guess just, yeah, what I was linking to before with some of the differences in my opinions versus um, Reginald Scott. So this little section is for Reginald if you're watching. All right, so first thing you may notice is that it is connected to a very old, dumb uh, smart trainer. I don't do a lot of indoor trainer. Thanks to having off-road bikes, it is great in winter to still be able to ride uh, out on a lot. You can 
really regulate your temperature quite well off-road because a lot of the descents are not going that fast. They might be a bit technical, so you're still working your body anyway. And so even on cold, wet days, you can actually stay pretty toasty for a, a lovely, nice ride out, uh, out and about. So yeah, I don't do a lot on uh, Ergo, and what I do, I mean, I just train to power um, anyway, and I haven't felt the need to go to a smart trainer. So I did try Zwift, eh, just by the time I faff around getting set up and choosing something, you know, like I just jump on, do my session. So yeah, that explains the very old dumb trainer. But yeah, the one for the part, so you can see here, uh, so this bike is now uh, basically, what is it? Oh, it's, I think it's around 11 years old uh, without checking my um, spreadsheet and just over 46,000 kilometers. Basically about the first sort of 40,000 of those were outdoors before it became the dedicated uh, indoor bike. And the, so this is the first gen DI2. Uh, the bike, I mean, the whole system still shifts like the day I bought it. So yes, nothing wrong at all um, with, you know, mechanical and you know, mechanical shifting if maintained. Um, those systems are also outstanding, but you know they do need to be maintained. And aside from plugging this into charge very periodically, uh, there is also something to be, to be said, I think, for the high quality, highly refined electronic systems from you know, Shimano and SRAM, where you can go for over a decade with absolutely perfect shifting without ever having to do a darn thing. Um, yeah, it has been flawless. Oh, sorry, a bit of a correction. Uh, it's yeah, just over forty-six thousand kilometers. I just checked my little spreadsheet on uh, on this bike, but this group set is over from the first Chippo that hit the kangaroo, and that had done just over fourteen thousand. So over sixty thousand kilometers, and it is just over eleven years of flawlessness. So you know, no replacing cabling. I know things can go wrong, but yeah, for mechanical systems. To keep them really running slick, for most people it is a recable every year or two. Um, depending on what your bike is, if that is, you know, these days it's likely to be internally routed, and if it's aero and internally routed, you know, that's not necessarily an easy or cheap maintenance job. And so a big part of why, you know, electronic systems are dominating more so than mechanical, even though some are going to love their mechanical, is simply that maintenance cost. Is going to be higher than assuming your electronic system gives you many many years of flawless service such as the case with this one on a quick similar story sorry all a bit missing and crowded here in the gym the wife's now dedicated trainer bike also a chippo rb1000 uh, her gen 1 di2 has done just over 50,000 kilometers so a little bit less than nine and hers is actually a little bit older though this is now 13 years old so Two sets of Gen 1 Di2 and two sets of 50 to 60,000 kilometers and over a decade with, yeah, like, again, they just shift like the day that we bought them. All right, now we get to really nice bike number one. So this I bought back in 2014. So the second Chippo was still, you know, had a lot of years of road service life going ahead of it, but I wanted something lighter because the Chippos were not very light. And that was sort of, pretty much, I think still peak, peak weight weenie days back then. And I also wanted, um, yeah, to have a dedicated race bike as opposed to one that I was hammering for both training and racing, because that enables you to do fun stuff like, you know, obviously really fast bearings in with time trial grease. Time trial grease is a pain in the butt to maintain, you know, really for most, be nearly impossible to, to keep up with that if that's also your training bike. So being able to just really dial up a bike to the nines to be as, you know, slick and fast as possible and have a bike, yeah, for racing and one for uh, smashing around training. Um, if you've got the means, it's a fun time. And so this was the bike I chose for that. I really like the 2014 Black Ink. I think the subtle sort of gold highlights on the, uh, the Stealth Black frame were, yeah, it's, it's, I think, the best colour scheme that they did in the, the, the Black Ink uh, Super 6s. And yeah, it's been a great bike. Um, initially, for weight, I did have the SRAM Red Double Tap. Um, obviously, uh, yeah, mechanical. That was the uh, the lightest group set at the time. I had a lot of trouble with that, so I switched that out to uh, Di2. And so you may notice I have a bit of a. Uh, let's see if I can move this without the camera going too funny, because I am having video issues. 
you can see that there is uh, you know, Dura-Ace do not make a crank like this. The SRAM red crank kind of looked funny with the Shimano Di2, so I had a guy paint this uh, crank with the same gold color lettering for Dura-Ace as the uh, Cannondale uh, gold highlights, and same with the, um, the NBC post. So just a few little bits that you can do here and there that, uh, yeah, make a bike just sort of lovely for yourself. So this has done just over 20,000 kilometers uh, since 2014, so yeah, not huge use. Uh, I do use this now. This is really the, the road training bike as well as road racing bike um, as my focus on sort of road is not what it uh, once was. So a bit of double duty there. But yeah, it's still just a lovely, lovely bike. Uh, obviously still rim brakes, so the, the brakes are perfectly groovy in dry conditions, not as great in wet conditions. However, the hunt wheels are a lot, lot better. I used to run lightweight, so both myself and my wife, Nisha, we ran lightweights on the road bikes for a long time because we believed that they were you know, all that in a bag of chips um, back in the day. But really, as time marched on, we discovered that compared to a lot of other options, they're, they're very narrow. I mean, they're 20 millimeter external. So with Josh's Rule 105, when I saw that, I was like, oh, God, that means, especially for racing, I've got to run 19 millimeter um, tires. At, you know, it's over 120 PSI, so very skittish, very harsh. And they braked terribly. They, so many of the sets, we had a number of sets, and so many of them had spots on the rim that would get a bit of brake pad build up, and so you would have anti-ABS braking, basically, uh, where one point in the wheel would always try to grab and lock up. So just, just shockers. And yeah, moving to I personally think the hunts are a great uh, just general option for me. Again, not that focused on the road, just want to have some good fun. No need to spend $5,000 uh, for, I guess, go fast wheels. Um, the, I think the price point and value of the hunts for the performance is, has been outstanding. So they've been a really smooth, awesome ride for some years now. And again, that will go against somebody who we'll be having some fun with soon, who has what I would say a completely and utterly inaccurate take on the hunt. All right, I'll go through a couple of bits on the journey of this one. So aside from it changing to DI2, I will have to check my spreadsheet as to when I upgraded to the Carbon TI chainring just for looks. And obviously you have that nice gold bolts. It does also have um, the, the mid OSPW. Uh, they are actually the Kogel gold wheels, <coughs> sorry, voice gone because you could actually just uh, plug and play those I did actually replace the uh, the hybrid ceramic bearings on these with pulley wheels you can if you wish um, just press them out and replace them with a full ceramic so I did that I love full ceramic bearings in pulleys uh, this did this bike did have some issues when it first began um, it would literally eat bottom bracket bearings no matter which ones I tried I went through five sets of bottom bracket bearings in fairly short order before we realized that yeah there was an issue with the bottom bracket uh, being too tight so if you only press the bearings in a little bit they would remain very smooth however as soon as you press them in to the depth they are meant to go the bottom bracket shell was just compressing the bejesus out of the bearings so uh, there are, as we know, quite a number of solutions to get around that these days. I personally, for this one, let me try to get this going. So I went with the THM. Uh, so this is from a long way back. So I mean, we're talking that I resolved the bottom bracket issue around a decade ago. Basically anything like this, and, and now you can just press out the stock bearings that come with that with whichever lovely bearings that you want to put back in, be they other quality steel or hybrid ceramic. So that, as soon as I change that, so this, a system like that, especially for the BB30 bottom bracket, which I can't believe ever actually went into production, shifting the bearings outboard so they are not under any compression via a, a press fit, um, and gives them a wider stance so there is less axial load going into radial bearing. The uh, bottom bracket, like I haven't needed to replace these uh, since then, that is a long time ago. And they are magnificent. Um, so I've been running traffic speed on most of my fast bikes for a long time, aside from trialing some other ones uh, here and there in between. 
Now, uh, anything else fun? I think that's mostly it. So yeah, it's just a beautiful, even though it's yeah, over a decade old and rim brake, it is a beautiful, beautiful bike to ride. Uh, and I still absolutely love it. And I have no plans to move it on uh, really any time at all. Right, sorry, last little bits for fun. So you may have noticed in the panning around that I am running a Campy Record 12-speed chain on my DI2 system. Uh, the Record chains are a beautiful chain, but why 12-speed on my DI2 11-speed? And basically, Campy recently, yeah, I guess compared to everybody else, finally brought out Masterlink. So now the latest 12-speed chains that we purchase have a Masterlink with them, which is extremely handy for everybody. And so the last few 12-speed uh, record chains that I had in stock that were Sans Masterlink, and I can't buy Masterlinks separately just to add to them because they're like 25 bucks each. So if you don't get it with the chain, you're pretty much out of luck there. So they are just removed from stock for me to wear my way through over the next decade or two since I'm on wax. And all right, let's see what else, just while we're talking on little odd bits while I'm here. Uh, things that you can find in a workshop, so this one again is for you, Reginald. You might enjoy the fact that I also have, what do you know, blind hole puller. Uh, wonder what we use those for, as well as a, oops, sorry, the camera as well, a Gilman camera bearing puller. I'm stuck across to here. What do we find in here? Bearing presses, the wonderful Abbey bearing press. Bearing presses, DT kit, all sorts of things to do bearings properly without a hammer. All right, so let's switch gears to my what is now my workhorse um, mountain bike. So this used to be my basically my only mountain bike and it used to do everything, so training and racing. And yeah, overall for many years served those sort of double duty really well. However, I did as I got uh, I guess more into the mountain bike racing side of things, I did get myself a, then a uh, I guess a more racy mountain bike and this became or moved across to be the yeah, just the workhorse mountain bike. So um, all actually wet muddy days this is the go-to sometimes it's the also the gravel bike but I usually try to just keep the abuse uh, to this one when it's when it's really sort of rough days uh, you can see it's sort of set up for carrying some stuff as well I do have a class in the city um, uh, some nights so it's great to be able to cruise down town carry some stuff uh, especially if it's like another just nice warm jacket I can just shove them in and out of the, the handlebar bag Pretty much everything on this bike has been replaced. Uh, it's on the second set of wheels, second fork, third rear shock. Uh, the brakes have uh, been replaced, both calipers and levers. Uh, yeah, I mean, literally everything except the frame has been replaced. That is the uh, fourth crank. I've broken three carbon fiber cranks on this one. Uh, a number of pedals. So yeah, they do have a hard life and it has done very, very well. It has also had a frame repair, so, uh, but that really wasn't the bike's fault. That was somebody pushing me off the trail and uh, onto a rock uh, that gave the top tube quite a fun time. The group set this came initially with, 11-speed um, mechanical Shimano, uh, which I had, I kept that on for just over 7,000 kilometers, and then I bought, upgraded it to um, X, sorry, XX1 Eagle Axis, uh, that was great. So I had a really great time with uh, with yeah the wireless eagle. The I bought a super caliber as uh, when I sort of got a bit more into the mountain bike uh, racing, so that I would then have yeah a nice race bike, and uh, then I've got my sort of workhorse training bike. And that was a GX build, so I moved the GX um, cassette and mech across to uh, this bike, and moved the XX1 cassette and mech across to the super cal. And they went with the Supercal because I sold that one relatively recently. So this now has the GX um, yeah, components on. But aside from that, so other little upgrades, uh, obviously just yeah, still very nice bearings. Despite the fact that this is now the training bike and it does a lot of wet, muddy work, 
Something that I will go into in more depth in the future. Sorry for the camera it's still gimbal having a mind of its own. Um, yeah, still have mostly ceramic speed bearings just because if things do go awry, if I'm a little bit slack with um, maintaining the grease levels, if the grease levels get low, that does make it a lot easier for crap to get in. And yeah, so one of the advantages of the really high quality hybrid ceramics is that you can flush clean them out and reset them and they go back to beautifully perfect silk again. So I did initially run the um, just yeah the, the stock race face uh, bearings in this for a while, but you go through those fairly quickly uh, and then you upgrade to uh, high quality uh, hybrid ceramics and then you basically have them more or less for the life of the bike just about well i mean i've done multiple flush cleans on uh, on these so far uh, due to some of the crap that it has ridden through and yeah everything is still absolutely mint now that's not a carte blanche free hybrid ceramic because there is a massive variance in quality and i guess yeah durability of hybrid ceramics however the couple of the uh, i guess the top level ones that i have been Trialing for pretty harsh off-road use for a while um, have been the Enduro XD90 and the Ceramic Speeds and yeah, they have been bomb-proof and we're talking years and many thousands of kilometers of really harsh um, you know, off-road riding where there are times after some races you, you see people at the, the next race meet and they go, yeah, well, I had to spend like 700 bucks replacing uh, bearings just front to back across the bike because they were just destroyed by the the rock dust that was uh, washed in through yeah really harsh uh, you know, mountain bike events and that was not the case for me so that is you know quite a handy thing last little bits on that so you might notice uh, it's got a pretty flash crank for what is ostensibly a fairly old not worth that much uh, mountain bike anymore that's just the workhorse that is a yeah, donation across from the, uh, I guess, the race mountain bike where that had a recent T-Type upgrade, which we'll see shortly, and the lovely E Wings titanium crank that was on that bike has now come across to this one. You'll notice there is a Sugai um, power meter spider for the E Wings crank. That was a recommendation by uh, Shane Miller or GP Lama. A really good price point, and although it's only a couple of thousand Ks old so far, to date that has been brilliant. So, yeah big tick for a I guess a well-priced um, power meter for a mountain bike crank so far okay let's have a look at what is oh, yeah on the off-road scene there's the now the race mountain bike this one's fairly new basically just on a couple of thousand k's old and oh sorry I think I on the previous bike I said for the bottom bracket uh, XD90 I meant to say XD15 um, I had in my brain a BB90 uh, bottom bracket that that one was for so, yeah, this uh, Mondraker, so the Supercal, I never really got along with it. It was just a little bit nervous for me. Um, the, yeah, the Mondraker, so one, basically 120 um, mil suspension front and rear, and it is a beautiful ride. Um, yeah, it's the, I am better at the longer mountain bike races, so um, I was still getting a bit beaten up on the uh, the Supercal, which uh, that Gen 1 only has 60 mil of rear travel. So this overall, because you've got the, the lockout front and rear, uh, magnificent. And yeah, so I treated that, uh, th this was initially an XX1 build. I treated that to a uh, recent T-Type upgrade, just because I've always been yeah quite curious about T-Type since it came out, and I wanted an excuse to upgrade my uh, Gravel CX race bike, which was still rocking 11-speed mechanical from the previous Gravel CX bike. So that uh, group set was getting very old. So there might be chips going off in the background. So yeah, I gave myself the excuse it was time to upgrade that uh, drivetrain. And the best way to do that was to move the XX1 across from this bike and then put T-Type on this one. So I think that was a grand, grand plan and so far all has been brilliant. Um, you can see on there there is the uh, that's the YBM SLA Mark 12 chain which is their chain for SRAM's flat top systems and yeah, the uh, OEM XXSL is hanging the bars there. Just testing uh, things out so far uh, as per all the tests they did in America with this one the Mark 12 chain has been perfect. 
So things are looking great for them to be just a real plug and play, um, faster upgrade because the SRAM chains, you know, they're not terrible, but they're not the fastest, you know, durable. Uh, they have that in spades in terms of wear life, but um, just speed has not been up there with the fastest for a little bit. And the YBN 12 speeds are up there with the fastest chains ever tested. So yeah, all going brilliantly for this bike so far. So um, yeah, we will look forward to many more races to come, hopefully. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, mountain bike tech keeps changing quite rapidly with many things. So yeah, always keeping on the space, but I mean, I only race pretty recreationally, so I don't need to have the latest, greatest, you know, things like electronic lockouts and electronic suspension. Um, just beautiful running drivetrain and a beautiful handling bike. Um, yeah, it's a, it is a grand old time out there. Just three, so whilst we're talking about, I guess, electronic versus mechanical, um, the electronic is obviously expensive and they are relatively heavy. However, they do still have some advantages. Um, just looping back to what I was talking about with um, the couple of extra videos of Reginald's that I watched where he's very anti electronic and very pro-mechanical and he had a fairly shocking situation with a customer where basically everything electronic didn't work and it was a pretty big pain in the ass. That's just not been my experience. I don't know how common that is because I don't you know, run a bike shop. But from my experience, the, yeah, the electronic shifting, both SRAM Axis and DI2, uh, it has been for yeah, well over a decade across all of them, a really exceptional time. I have had uh, one error with the DI2 on the Cannondale where just out of the blue, right before a race, even though the battery was fully charged, the rear mech would not shift nor the front mech. Uh, it was actually turned out to be an error with the battery and I had to do an 80 odd kilometer race in one gear and that was extremely difficult. Uh, there were times where I was doing 140 cadence and needing to bridge a gap when someone dropped the wheel and I'm trying to spin it up to 170 and you know 50 k's an hour odd it was uh, it was rough and then obviously not so much fun on the climbs uh so outside of one battery um in all this time going bung on a di2 um i've had yeah no issues with the axis uh in fact there was one time where literally the day before a race i smashed the rear mech and now the eagle mechs are quite hard to damage and i managed it um and i could just unbolt the mech from my training bike back across to the race bike that I was just you know, doing checks before uh, race day to make sure it was all good. Repair it to the uh, the lever, and I mean, in five minutes I've changed a mech, and I'm good to go for the race. And things are just not that easy if it is mechanical. Again, such situations are extremely rare. However, you know, just contrast of what one person's experience versus another. My experience with electronic has been amazing and I am pretty good at doing simple things like charging batteries. Um, I don't think like if you have a car and you forget to fill it up, I don't think that's the car's fault. So, you know, that's really the case with electronic for me. Alrighty, getting there. So this is the uh, yeah, Gen 1 Aspro. I did have a Trek Boon, which I had for a few years prior to this, uh, which was yeah, my sort of first CX and, uh, and gravel bike. Um, couldn't resist this frame set. I just love the color and I really like the direction that this fellow was going with the Aspro. So bought the frame set, transferred the, uh, the sort of, uh, Juras mechanical uh, disc brake from the Boon across to this. I ran that for a number of years. So all up that mechanical group set had done a bit over six years worth of uh, work on the first bike and then this bike before this one's recent uh, upgrade to XX1, courtesy of me putting the T-Type on the Mondraker. So yeah, it's all very lovely now. I was pushing the limits of the cassette range um, on the 11 speed mechanical and you know, shifting was okay, but when you push things to the limits, it's not brilliant. Uh, now I have greater range at the top end and bottom end and magnificent shifting. So yeah, going to the 12 speed electronic has been a very pleasurable change. Um, overall, yeah, so I've got uh, CX wheels for this as well. So I switched between uh, the, the gravel wheels and the CX wheels, depending on obviously what I'm doing. It has an Ingrid crank, which has unfortunately had a little bit of uh, color rubbing off since, thanks to some 
<laughs> rides have been pretty muddy and I've worn my winter shoes and mud between the shoes and the crank. That has been the result. But overall, yeah, um, beautiful bike. Another recent upgrade uh, has actually been, I've uh, just put the Axis dropper on this. Have always been a little bit, I don't know, do I need the extra weight? Um, you know, how often am I gonna use a dropper post on a gravel bike or CX bike? And I wasn't keen to add another you know, remote to, to sort of run a cheaper one than the Axis. Uh, the Axis, uh, you just depress both uh, levers at the same time and you know, that, that actuates the dropper, so that's super handy. However, they finally, they were on sale um, at a place, so I just decided to give it a go. And so it's early days. Um, so far, I do like it. I don't know how much I will or won't use it uh, and whether or not I'll keep it, but I'm going to give it a good trial run and, uh, and see if dropper and gravel is, yeah, yeah, worth it for me. So I think it's gonna be one of those very individual things. But um, yeah, it was time to just give it a whirl. So yeah, nothing too much. I'm gonna, I'll probably come back to this one more when I do the first video where we talk about some groovy bearing hints and tips. Uh, but overall, that's pretty much it. It's a lovely bike. I think the, the latest gen the Aspros are really something. I know that like a, a bunch of the top uh, races in the Adelaide scene have the Aspros and they absolutely love them. So they race them for gravel at you know, top level, uh, cyclocross, and you know they just put the road wheels on and race them in at the, at the front end of the A grade road races and uh, you know doing the chop on the Saturdays and things like that. So they are an extremely versatile uh, bike and. Yeah, for some that aren't going to have a whole <laughs> quiver of bikes like I've got, um, yeah, they. I think this is one of the true bikes that with just uh, multiple sets of wheels, you can have basically two to three bikes in one and doing an outstanding job at all of them. So I'm not saying it's the only one that does that, but certainly I think the Aspro has been a brilliant uh, bike by Cervelo. All right, nearly there. Um, this is a Trek Speed Concept, uh, so this is my updated time trial bike. I previously had a BMC um, time machine, that was my time trial bike for basically seven years and I would never have bothered to upgrade that, uh, even though it's yeah, sort of not the world's best uh, brakes, being the old rim brakes and um, the, I guess the TP bikes that era, you did have to run relatively narrow tyres as well, there just wasn't the clearance in the rear especially. But I'm pretty terrible at time trials due to a, a back injury and general flexibility. I can run hardly any drop. So I am a veritable windsock trying to push through the air. However, TTs are still just yeah, good fun to, uh, to get out to and do. And yeah, it's another sort of groovy way to keep trying to tick up my little race tally towards a thousand, which is going to take, uh, yeah, still quite some time. Uh, I got skittled on that by a four-wheel drive, so uh, her insurance paid for the upgrade to this magnificent looking machine. So that's why I yeah, have the upgrade here. Uh, this overall, like obviously there's a few things that add to the comfort. It does have the ISO speed. I don't know how much that really, I guess, adds or doesn't add. I know it adds weight and this is not a light bike. Yeah, but just the ability to run the wider tires and so on, um, it does make this a much better ride. Uh, it's much more comfortable over rougher terrain in the TT bars, uh, especially than the, uh, the previous BMC. And it just looks pretty killer. So yeah, overall the upgrade was uh, was quite nice. It was sort of, I guess, overall worth a bit of a bung knee for a while and some bruises and grazes. Uh, I was pretty lucky to get away with um, nothing too major. So yeah, probably I think the main thing, this seems to be the generation um, of the some really heavy models. I was quite shocked. I thought initially there must be something wrong uh, with my bike. So despite being a Durace build, um, these wheels are decent. Uh, I have uh, a new disc and, and front wheel for the actual time trial. So I've got a, um, a Princeton Carbon Mark 70, 70, 7580, 7550, I can't remember. And an uh, Aero Coach Orbit rear disc. But I mean, these things, yeah, weigh like 10 kilo. So on a decent climb, although weight at the end of the day is not that important, it's, it is, I think, over a certain limit where your brain goes, oh, I feel like I'm riding a bit of a bus up this hill. Um, so I believe, you know, really across the last probably 
in a year or so generation of TT bikes, a number of brands have been working to bring the weight of those right down. So I will probably be stuck with the generation of potentially the heaviest time trial bikes that, uh, that came out. As they, th this is sort of really the first gen where the UCI relaxed the aero rules and so they're able to go deeper on the profiles and so on, but I just don't get how this weighs literally 10 kilograms. Um, I built up um, before the Super Calibre, I had a, um, a hardtail mountain bike and that was nine and a half kilograms. You know, and it's got 700 gram tires plus sealant, plus you have an 1800 gram fork. How is my mountain bike nine and a half kilo and a time trial bike without any suspension or massive tires, uh, 10 kilograms? I know it's got a cockpit and so on, but yeah, it's a beautiful bike. Um, it's good that I'm not too much worried about the speed because I'm an old Hubbard with low flexibility, but 10 kilo is really taking things a little bit to extremes and that does line up a little bit with what uh, I guess Reginald has in his thoughts on uh, the more aero bikes. All right, here we go. The piece de resistance. The, whoa, sorry, this camera. The, yes, recent addition, uh, addition thanks to me turning 50, is a magnificent bastion. So this was a, obviously a custom build, as they are. Uh, some years in the making, I didn't have this one on a rush. We started sort of playing this a long time ago, so I was, uh, yeah, I would give them plenty of time to uh, get this built in time uh, for me getting older. And yeah, for me, this is, I, I am actually one of those sus subscribers to the Forever Bike uh, concept. Uh, it's something that I think uh, cops a bit of flack sometimes and potentially rightly so. However, you know, I look at my Cannondale that's 10 years old and rides beautifully, um, that DI2 group set. Yeah, it's a decade old and uh, yeah, I can't see any issues coming up with that anytime soon. Uh, if at some stage I do need to upgrade that group set, then uh, the latest 12 speed group set is going to go at least another 10 years. So, with even, I guess, allocating, say, a decade per uh, latest group set, there's two decades pretty easily done. And so, it's really going to be, I think, illness, injury, and you know, my own longevity, you know, hopefully more so than the bikes. Um, that uh, I don't think there's going to be a technology issue as such that um, prevents some of the you know, beautiful custom builds and even just you know, very good uh, non-custom bikes for someone aiming for a very long-term relationship if that's what you know, the path they want to go. And that's definitely for me. Uh, I can't, I, I, just for the road, I cannot get into, uh, I guess, the latest, fastest aero or aero slash climbing bikes. I, I don't have any, I guess, focus on how fast I am or am not on the road. I'm still sort of fast enough to uh, enjoy riding with my friends. If I go into a road race, whatever grade I'm in, I'll just race and have a groovy time wherever I'm at. I want a bike that when I look at, I just can't wait to get on it again. And just a beautiful bike um, to, you know, that you just love to get out and ride. And yeah, have a great long-term relationship with and it's something that, especially I guess with a you know, custom build, then it's something you know, right off the bat that is special to yourself. You, know, you get to make a lot of decisions along the way, You're part of the, you know, the process sort of from day dot. So if you're lucky enough to sort of have the means, then yeah, it is a really fun path. So the whole journey, even just to get the bike, has been a fun time. And I, I am hopefully going to be able to get out on this one for the first ride this weekend. Just got the last couple of bits to, um, to get sorted for it. Uh, so obviously um, degreasing and waxing the chain. I do have some carbon PI discs uh, just arrived thankfully in time today that I will be popping on versus the stock Durace. Uh, no issues obviously with the stock Durace, just um, carbon TI disc rotors is going to complete the look a bit more. So yeah, having a, a bit of a look uh, at a couple of the individual uh, choices we can see there we have a magnificent 3D titanium crank. I wonder if I can get this to zoom. Sort of. Sort of. Sorry, we'll move it manually. So, yeah, paired to, I mean, I wouldn't have necessarily chosen SRM as a, a power meter of choice. However, 
they are the uh, the spider that they sort of pair up the 3D uh, titanium print, uh, printed crank to, and they do really look pretty mint overall as a package, so can't fault that there. Uh, you can't really obviously justify the cost for titanium oversized uh, pulleys, however, again, I'm amortizing all decisions on this bike over about a 30 year period, so uh, <laughs> I took some license with some of those. Just everything about you know, a, a build like this, I think that it's just really beautiful. Uh, Sebastian's uh, 3D printed integrated uh, cockpit. Um, yeah, just you get your 3D printed uh, titanium Garmin mount. And overall, yeah, it is just a fine, fine machine. Now I know also some people do have some issues with uh, <laughs> price of some bikes that you know you can't justify spending what a bike like this costs versus say you know a bike that costs a third the price the, a bike a third the price is going to perform obviously magnificently as well uh, but if you're lucky enough to sort of have the means and you do love the hobby that you're doing um, I think we should give people license to be able to enjoy that how they wish to enjoy it if somebody is into you know their fishing I don't think we tend to begrudge them that they buy a big four wheel drive to tow their nice boat um, and that will in general cost a lot more than a lovely bike or if someone likes their cars and they spend you know buy themselves a nice car north of a hundred thousand dollars quite likely the depreciation in just one year will be the same as a magnificent bike that you might aim to keep for the next two to three decades so i mean everything is obviously relative but from my personal view i think everyone should enjoy their cycling the way that they wish to enjoy their cycling and not be too judgmental on one person or another. Um, I think the last little bit that I forgot to mention on this one, yeah, the probably I guess yeah, the most expensive little upgrade bit on this was the Partington wheels. Yeah, and I sort of went with the you know Aussie company theme. Um, these were reviewed by uh, Dave Rome as pretty much the nicest wheels he has ridden, so it sort of helped make my decision on uh, on what wheels to go with for this one. And yeah. Let's uh, let's hope this is one Rolls Royce feeling machine when we get it out on the road. If it rides anywhere near as good as it looks, uh, things are going to be grand times indeed. Right, yeah, I forgot to cover in my sort of quick run throughs. One sort of personal choice decision you may have noticed that uh, across the off road bikes, uh, I'm very much on sort of the SRAM Axis wireless system, whereas on the road bikes, I am a Shimano guy. I won't go into not campy because once I started on that, I would give you probably about a 30 minute monologue. Yes, Campy do make some beautiful things and do some great things, but again, you don't get me started. Um, I also, yeah, I'm a big fan of what SRAM have done in the, uh, especially the one-by uh, space for off-road. They have really pioneered a particular path there and just going off the market share, we can see how popular that is. For road, however, I do just find that, you know, Shimano's DI2 is just so refined and just a personal pet peeve I've never been able to sort of get past the move to smaller rings for road I know we won't notice the efficiency difference in our cycling but it's there it is a mathematical and just basic physics thing you can't get around smaller uh, rings and corresponding smaller cogs for a given gear inches it is less efficient in the smallest cog it's uh, you know a decent bit but even across the range it might only be say two to three watts on average but i just don't think that we should be taking a step backwards in drivetrain efficiency to go to the latest and greatest uh, wireless drivetrains so it is just a pet peeve i would have to push myself past i know we can get larger rings but yeah it's it's just it shouldn't be the default that you have a step back in efficiency unless you kind of fight to uh, change parts and go forwards the other thing, and this again is just personal, and but you know, at the end of the day, we're all individuals and we all have our personal preferences that we make decisions around. For road, I just don't like the size of the SRAM Axis front mech. Uh, yes, there are advantages to having, I guess, batteries that you can detach front and rear as opposed to one central battery with DI2. But again, I don't have issues charging batteries, I find that a fairly simple task. Uh, I have never run flat that I can remember in my life with a battery, either DI2 or SRAM. And the much more diminutive uh, Gerace front mech without having to have a battery bolted to it just personally appeals to me a lot more 
and yeah, for me, I'm just still Shimano all the way for uh, for road. And it's gonna be interesting if Shimano ever tempts me away from that uh, off-road one day because yeah, Australian, I think, have been doing a lot of great stuff there for a long time. Right, last little bit. So let's have a look. This just in. I did actually pre-buy the carbon TI rotors. However, I assumed that it would be 160 disc and they came out to be 140. So I had to rebuy 140 carbon TI rotors. Uh, that's a little bit ouch. However, that's okay. It's introduced me to put the carbon TI uh, rotors on my nice TT wall so they can go on the um, the Princeton front and the uh, Aero Coach rear. But yeah, these are just a thing of beauty that will match the uh, Bastion quite lovely. Uh, always Durace pedals for me for road. Um, just, yeah, never been tempted away to uh, the look feet. And I did treat myself also to some new shoes for this bike by uh, Nimble. Haven't tried Nimble before. They do review quite well. They do look the bomb. So let's hope that uh, they complete the Bastion ride experience uh, to level 10. All right, so I think in the cycling game of N plus one, I reckon I'm going all right. I started with a yeah, $2,000 Malvern Star Oppie to uh, make the return to cycling in my adult life at about the age of, I think, 36. And since then, actually, sorry, is it, yeah, 36, 38, I can't remember. So now we have two amazing road bikes, one of them most especially amazing, two mountain bikes, a new time trial bike, a cyclocross and gravel race bike, and a dedicated trainer bike. Uh, got most bases covered fairly well for what I'm doing at the moment. There's potential plans for other expansions in the future, but uh, I'm not going to get too ahead of myself just yet. Uh, at the moment, I am having a ball on many different types of cycling, uh, and I'm ex just yeah extremely lucky to be able to obviously have the fleet that I have and uh, enjoy all the different types of cycling that I'm able to enjoy, and I hope to be able to continue that for as long as possible. All right, that better do. I just noticed it's over an hour, so sorry about that. Hope the run through was overall okay. Let me know what you think. Um, what decisions do you agree with, disagree with? What things you like, dislike? Um, any thoughts, comments will be all very interesting. Got a bit on this weekend, so I might not get to too many comments until uh, next week, but I will see. And overall, yeah, um, I do get the pleasure of sometimes when I'm chatting uh, with uh, customers emailing in with inquiries about certain uh, you know best choices uh, I get to see some great uh, bikes emailed in from time to time as well so if you're ever chatting to me about a particular uh, decision that you're weighing up with regards to sort of lubricant or chain for your drivetrain uh, feel free if you've got them handy to send in any awesome pics of your own great machines um, yeah bicycles are unreal they are the world's most efficient machine we get to zoom around all sorts of places have all sorts of adventures they keep us fit and healthy they keep us uh, yeah, in contact with lots and lots of great people that we meet out there on the roads and the trails. And um, yeah, hopefully you're enjoying your cycling as much as I am. Uh, I, you know, I think, what is it? Yeah, 12 odd years now and I'm enjoying it more every year still. And I kind of keep my fingers crossed that that, that keeps going. Uh, obviously, huge thanks again to the uh, lovely wifey for the, uh, the Bastion for the 50th. I, I have a little bit of time until it is her 50th. I'm not sure what she'll be <laughs> looking for, but uh, just in case I had better up my game with selling bicycle chain lubricants because mm, you don't make a huge amount on those. Uh, I'll have to move some units. Uh, all right. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, look forward to your thoughts and comments. And uh, yeah, I will chat to you next week.